to British Murders, a true crime podcast with a focus on British murder cases. My name's Stuart Blues, and I'm excited for you to join me on this journey of morbid discovery. I'm by no means an expert on the subjects of homicide and serial killers. However, I have always had a sick fascination with them. Together, we will learn about some of the lesser known British murderers, as well as glimpsing occasionally at some of the more notorious ones. The bite-sized presentation of this podcast is intentional, as we look to cover an overview of the respective timelines of each case succinctly. You may not be a huge science buff, or even be remotely interested in chemistry, but I would bet good money that you will have heard of a chemical called sulfuric acid. After all, it's the most frequently used chemical in the world, and used in almost all industries. It's mainly used in the manufacture of fertilisers, as well as in the preparation of dyes, drugs, paints, among other things. But why on earth am I discussing a colourless, odourless and viscous liquid? Yeah, I know all them big words. The reason? This episode of British Murders focuses on an individual who used this widely available acid in a more sadistic way, to dispose of the bodies of his victims. John George Haig was born on July 24th, 1909, in Stamford, Lincolnshire, a county in the East Midlands of England. Haig's parents, John Robert Haig and his wife Emily, were conservative Protestants who raised him in the mining village of Outwood, West Yorkshire, in the north of England. Haig's parents belonged to a religious sect known as the Plymouth Brethren. They were purist and anti-clerical. Almost all forms of casual entertainment, music, carnivals, magazines and newspapers were regarded as sinful. Only stories from the Bible were acceptable. What a childhood. As a result of his parents' strict beliefs and practices, Haig regularly suffered from recurring religious nightmares throughout his childhood. In spite of this, Haig was a very creative child who took to learning the piano at home at a young age. He soon discovered he had a talent for it and ended up becoming a highly regarded pianist, taking inspiration from classic composers such as Johann Sebastian Bach, Tchaikovsky and Antonio Vivaldi, often attending concerts featuring their music. Haig first won a scholarship to Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, before securing another scholarship to Wakefield Cathedral, becoming a choir boy in the process. Haig spent his time after school working as an apprentice at a motor engineer company. Throughout his late teens, Haig worked a variety of jobs at various insurance and advertising firms. When Haig was 21, he was fired from his job after being suspected of stealing from a cash box. On July 6th, 1934, Haig married a 23-year-old named Beatrice Hamer, affectionately known as Betty. It wasn't a match made in heaven though, as the marriage fell apart soon after the vows were exchanged. In the fall of 1934, Haig was jailed for the first time. The charge was for fraud. This is something that will be a recurring theme throughout his story. While Haig was in prison, Betty gave birth to a baby girl. It wasn't a fairy tale, however, as Betty immediately gave the baby up for adoption. This decision resulted in Haig being ostracised from his family as a result of their conservative beliefs. In 1936, Haig moved to London, becoming a chauffeur and maintenance man to William McSwan, a wealthy owner of amusement arcades. If you're not familiar, these are the things in the UK where you have coin machines, 2p machines, you might have some gambling machines on there, pinball, all that kind of stuff, the claw that picks up toys, all that kind of stuff is in an amusement arcade. They're very popular at coastal resorts. Haig's penchant for fraud continued in spite of his previous arrest, he pretended to be a solicitor named William Cato Adamson with various offices in southern England. Haig, or Adamson as he was going by, sold fraudulent shares of stock at below market rates, claiming them to be from the estates of his deceased clients. 
The scam was uncovered on the back of a spelling mistake of all things. Haig had misspelled Guildford as Guildford on his letterhead without the letter D. Any self-respecting solicitor wouldn't make such a basic mistake. If they did, then I probably wouldn't pay them the drastic fee that they were charging. Haig was sent to prison, again for fraud, this time for a period of four years. He was released just after the start of World War II. Somehow, he managed to miss being called up to serve for his country in the war. A little bit of a lucky escape for him, I think. His love of being a fraudster didn't stop there. He continued to defraud people and was sent to prison on several more occasions. The penny finally dropped with Haig as to why he was continually getting caught. The victims were left alive after being defrauded. What a eureka moment. Taking inspiration from a French murderer named George Alexander Sarrett, I'm probably butchering that if anyone speaks French, Haig decided that after killing his victims, he would dispose of the bodies by dissolving them in acid. In 1925, George Alexandre Sarrett, that's such a British way of saying it, Georges Alexandre Sarrett, George Sarrett, had disposed of his two victims as bodies using sulfuric acid. He was executed by guillotine on April 10th, 1934. Perhaps Haig should have made a note of the grim finale of George or Georges Alexandre Sora Sarrett. After deciding on how to dispose of his future victims, Haig used his remaining time in prison to experiment with sulfuric acid, naturally. Using glass jars from the kitchens, dead field mice brought in from the fields, and small quantities of acid taken from the tinsmith shop, Haig found out that it only took 30 minutes for the bodies of the mice to dissolve in the acid. Now mice aren't exactly human size, but I can sort of appreciate his logic here with this experiment, but I wouldn't use that as a reference point for humans. In 1943, Haig was freed from prison, becoming an accountant with an engineering firm. As a cruel act of fate, Haig bumped into his former employer, William McSwan, one night in the Goat Pub in Kensington, London. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Poor William. McSwan introduced Haig to his parents, Donald and Amy, whom he worked for by collecting rent owed on their London properties. Haig felt McSwan was trying to rub his affluent lifestyle in his face. It became insanely jealous. On September 6th, 1944, William McSwan disappeared. Three days later, on September 9th, 1944, Haig lured McSwan into the basement of his workshop at Gloucester Road, London, and proceeded to kill him by hitting him over the head. The term workshop is used quite loosely here. It was essentially an empty room next to a factory. Haig then put McSwan's body into a 40-gallon drum and poured concentrated sulfuric acid onto it. Unsurprisingly, the body didn't dissolve in 30 minutes as the mice's bodies had. After two days, Haig returned to find that the body had become a ghastly sort of sludge. Unsure what to do, Haig poured the sludge, formerly William McSwan, down an ironically named manhole. McSwan's parents were told by Haig that their son had gone into hiding in Scotland to avoid being called up for military service. This struck McSwan's parents as odd, considering the war was sort of coming to an end at this point. On July 2nd, 1945, Haig lured McSwan's parents back to the same Gloucester Road property, telling them their son was back from Scotland for a surprise visit. Haig proceeded to murder McSwan's parents in the same basement where he met his own fate. Once more, his execution style was blows to the head, followed by pouring sulfuric acid onto McSwan's parents' bodies in 40-gallon drums, tipping the subsequent sludge down the same manhole as before. You might say it should be called a menhole. Too soon, too soon. After stealing McSwan's pension checks and selling his parents' properties, Haig was in profit by around £8,000. In 2020, that's around £347,000 after inflation. Haig loved to gamble, however, and by 1947, he was running out of money as a result of his addiction. 
In an attempt to repay his outstanding debts, Haig decided to kill yet again. This time, the victims were Dr. Archibald Henderson and his wife, Rose. After showcasing his skills as a pianist and pretending to be interested in buying a house they were selling, Haig was invited to play the piano for the housewarming party of the Hendersons. During the party, Haig stole Dr. Henderson's revolver. He planned to kill Dr. Henderson, as well as his wife, with his own gun. Haig leased a little workshop on Leopold Road in Crawley, a large town in West Sussex, which is South East England. He moved the sulfuric acid and drums from the Gloucester Road property to the workshop in preparation for the Hendersons. On February 12, 1948, Haig drove Dr. Henderson to his workshop. Haig had excitedly explained to Dr. Henderson that he had a new invention to show him. Upon arrival, Haig immediately shot Dr. Henderson in the head with his own revolver. After next luring Rose Henderson to the workshop, this time by saying that Dr. Henderson had fallen ill, Rose was given the same treatment as her husband. Upon arrival, she was shot dead. Haig utilised the acid and drums he had brought from Gloucester Road and dissolved the bodies as he had done before. Once the Henderson's bodies were disposed of, Haig used his wicked expertise to forge a letter from them, selling all of their possessions for, again, £8,000. Strangely, Haig opted not to sell the Henderson's car, as well as their dog, which he kept as his own pet. Talk about a slap in the face. The sixth and final victim of John Haig was an elderly lady named Olive Duran Deacon. The wealthy 69-year-old was the widow of highly respected solicitor John Durant Deacon. Haig was now in the guise of an engineer. Believing Haig's story, Olive mentioned in passing an idea that she had for artificial fingernails. On February 18th, 1949, Haig invited Olive to his workshop. Once inside, he shot her in the back of the neck with Dr. Henderson's 38 caliber Webley revolver. After stripping Olive of her valuables, Haig placed her into his now formulaic acid bath. On February 28th, 1949, ten days after being murdered, Olive was reported as missing by her friend Constance Lane. Constance had become suspicious at Olive's disappearance and continually questioned Haig's involvement. In order to attempt to keep Constance quiet, Haig agreed to visit Chelsea Police Station with her to report Olive's disappearance. Unfortunately for Haig, once there, the desk sergeant recognised him and did a background check. This is where Haig's luck ran out, finally. Police discovered Haig's record of theft and fraud. Haig was arrested while a search of his hotel room took place. The entire workshop was thoroughly searched shortly after. For someone so thorough... With regards to disposing of bodies, this part really makes you scratch your head at his sloppiness. The detectives found Haig's attache case in the workshop. It contained a dry cleaner's receipt for Olive's coat, as well as papers referring to the Hendersons and the McSwans. Why would you keep that as sort of a sick souvenir? It's just stupid. It is important to note here that, unlike the workshop on Gloucester Road, the workshop in Crawley did not contain a floor drain covered by a manhole or a menhole. As a result, the remains of Olive and the Hendersons, not to be confused with a 1987 comedy with a similar name, they were poured out on a rubble pile at the back of the property. Investigation of the area by pathologist Keith Simpson revealed 28 pounds of human body fat, part of a human foot, human gallstones and part of a denture which was later identified by Olive's dentist during the subsequent trial. Haig asked Detective Inspector Albert Webb during questioning, Tell me, frankly, what are the chances of anybody being released from Broadmoor? This is the famous high security psychiatric hospital in Berkshire which I discussed on my London cannibal episode about Peter Bryan. After Inspector Webb said that he could not discuss that sort of thing, Haig replied, Well, if I told you the truth, you would not believe me. It sounds too fantastic to believe. Haig confessed to killing Olive, the McSwans and the Hendersons, as well as three other victims, a young man called Max, 
a girl from East Bourne in East Sussex, and a woman from Hammersmith, West London. It has to be made clear, however, that the last three claimed victims could not be confirmed. Haig remained in custody at Horsham Police Station in Horsham, West Sussex. The cell door where Haig stayed at Horsham Police Station is now preserved in the Horsham Museum. Haig's response to the charge was a plea of insanity, claiming that he had drunk the blood of his victims. What is it with serial killers and cannibalism, honestly? It became apparent during the trial that Haig mistakenly believed that if the bodies of his victims could not be found, a murder conviction would not be possible. He had misunderstood the meaning of the term corpus delicti. This essentially means the substantial and fundamental fact necessary to prove the commission of a crime, as well as the material substance, such as the body of the victim of a murder, upon which a crime has been committed. Basically, it means that if there's something there which proves that you've killed someone, so like the body fat, the denture from olive, that kind of stuff, that's enough. You don't think there's no physical human-shaped body, I've got away with it. It doesn't work like that, John. Despite the absence of the victim's bodies, there was sufficient forensic evidence for Haig to be convicted for the murders. John was found guilty after just 17 minutes by the jury and sentenced to death by hanging. Just before his execution, Haig was asked if he wanted a brandy, replying, Make it a large one, old boy. I'm not sure why, but that response did tickle me. On August 10th, 1949, Haig was led to the gallows and hanged. A number of TV shows, movies and video games have made reference to the gruesome murders of John Haig, none so perhaps more famously than a 2002 British TV movie called A is for Acid. I haven't heard of it either. But anyway, it stars Martin Clunes, who is of Doc Martin and Men Behaving Badly fame. Those are two very popular British TV shows, if anyone from outside of the UK is wondering. When I say Doc Martin, I don't mean the boots. And that was a story of British murderer John Haig, better known as the Acid Bath Killer. For more on British murders, please like and subscribe to my channel on social media. All the links are in the description. Please send me your case suggestions via social media, or you can send us an email, britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. I'll cover them in a future episodes if I find them remotely interesting, which I'm sure I will. If you're enjoying British Murders, please leave me a review on iTunes and Facebook. It really helps my channel grow and it would be greatly appreciated. For now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.